You're listening to Sound Waves with the Florida Orchestra's pre-concert talk series, where you get the real story behind composers and their music, straight from members of your Florida Orchestra. This is a live recorded conversation from our Masterworks concert on January 6, 2023 at Strauss Center for the Performing Arts in Tampa, Florida. In this episode, you'll hear from TFO trombonist Ross Holcomb, composer Joshua Sardinia, tuba soloist and TFO principal tuba TJ Graff, as well as guest conductor Fauzi Haymore. A special thank you to Smith & Associates Real Estate for sponsoring our pre-concert talks. Enjoy. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our pre-concert talk at the Florida Orchestra. My name is Ross Holcomb. I am the associate principal trombonist of the orchestra. And this is my first time to lead one of these pre-concert lectures. So I'm really pleased to be here and uh, thrilled to have been asked. This is our esteemed guest conductor for the week, Fauzi Haymore. Please, a round of applause for him. Good evening. Hello. How are you guys? Nice and sunny. It's a gorgeous day out there. I come from San Francisco where we're getting hit pretty hard, but you know, actually we need it. So. Yeah. Um, so tonight you guys are in for a real treat. Um, I was thinking about this on my way over that, you know, this is the Masterworks series and a lot of times people think about Masterworks and they think, you know, Beethoven, Mozart, maybe, you know, Brahms or Mahler or whatever. We don't have any of those people on this concert tonight. Um, but the name of the series holds true, Masterworks. Every single piece on this concert is a true masterwork. Um, and most of them are, are just, I mean, I would just call them American music. You know, it's, uh, it defies genre, it defies classification, and in fact, we can talk about that with the Ellington, because that was one of Duke Ellington's philosophies, was he didn't want to be pigeonholed into thinking that, you know, I'm a jazz composer. He was just a composer, and he wrote American music. Um, but before we get into all of the, the program tonight, um, you know, I know you must be a little bit curious about our guest conductor, uh, Fauzi Haymore. So I know you hate to talk about yourself, but maybe just one minute. Can you let sure. us know, you know, where are you from? Where did you study? What do you spend your time doing when you're not here in Florida guest conducting? Certainly. Um, so I, I live in San Francisco, as I just said. Uh, a little bit. I've been there since the early 90s. Um, and it's, it is one of my favorite places on earth, I have to say. And I spend most of my life there, and then I fell in love with someone in Canada, and she agreed to come to San Francisco. And so my wife and I, we are so in love that we have four children, um, three girls, and then the, the boy decides to show up. Um, and, you know, so, so I, I, I think we're good. Um, as far as my background, uh, you know, I went to UC Davis for a while, um, many years there. I did a master's in conducting over there, and then I went to Indiana University after that. One of the largest music schools in the country. We have, um, <clears throat> currently, I want to say around 2,300 musicians. So as a conductor, that's, you know, that was really a very special time, you know, to be able to work with so many musicians, really world-class musicians. So it was really a great part of my life. And, um, and then I, I started to, to work professionally, um, was with the Alabama Symphony for, uh, for a few years as an assistant, and then I went to the Pittsburgh Symphony um, for about three years there. Um, and then I've had a post in, uh, in Germany, in Reutlingen. Has anybody ever heard of Reutlingen before? It's okay if you haven't. Oh, really? Wow, we should talk after. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. Well, it's, it's close to Stuttgart. Um, and so I, I had a post there for about three years. And uh, yeah, and so I'm still in San Francisco and uh, having the time of my life. Nice. So just one more question, if you'll indulge me. This is just from a musician's perspective. I'm always curious with our guest conductors. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between being music director somewhere versus guest conducting somewhere? And, you know, obviously as a guest conductor this week, you know, what's going through your head when you step up on the podium? What are you listening for? What are you noticing? What, you know, what are you thinking about when you're in front of an orchestra for the first time in a while? Because you've been here once before, right? Yeah, yeah. It's been so, a few years. yeah, can you talk about that, being a guest conductor? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for that. You know, it, it is definitely different. I mean, when, when, as a music director, you know, you are, your goal is to try to develop a specific sound with an orchestra. And, and when I say a specific sound, it's not my sound, okay? It is, we're doing, it's an, a, a collaborative effort, right? Particularly me, my philosophy with building an orchestra is really putting my two cents in, but also accepting their interpretations. And, and, and that, that, I have to say, is the same with guest conducting. And, um, you know, I'm not necessarily trying to change a sound uh, uh, when I'm guest conducting an orchestra, but I truly enjoy the collaboration. Um, I'm not, uh, you can... You can, you can tell me if I'm, if I'm not telling the truth here, but I am not a dictator on the podium, and, and I don't mean to be. I actually love 
to hear ideas from the orchestra. And I'll tell you, if I hear an idea that I think works really well, it's like, you know, it's better than my idea, let's do it. And then you have one concept, right? Some things that I contribute, some things the orchestra contribute, and that means that you'll never hear it anywhere else on the planet, right? Because it's just us at this moment, and that's what makes the concert so special. So whenever I'm guest conducting, that's really what I'm trying to get, is to hear what they have to contribute, and of course take many of their ideas, offer some of my own, perhaps, and then we have this very special performance. It's gonna be a blast tonight. Well, I can, I can vouch for that. He's been incredibly collaborative this whole week, and we really appreciate um, how flexible and how, um, I don't know, wonderful he's been on the podium. We really do appreciate him. Um, so why don't we hop into the program now? Um, our first piece on the program is by uh, a living composer, Joshua Sardinia, uh, and he is actually here tonight, so I'd like to invite him out to talk about his piece. Uh, I'm going to butcher the German, but Feuertrunken. Yeah, that's right. yeah. that's <laughs> Joshua, come on out. So, as I said, this is Joshua Sardinia, uh, and he composed this piece for the Detroit Symphony, I think, uh, 2017, right? 17, yeah. Yeah, it had its premiere. And uh, this piece has a tie-in to both Beethoven 9 and Mahler's First Symphony. So, can you tell us a little bit about those tie-ins, then maybe what you'd like people to know about the piece you wrote? I mean, the, the most immediate tie-in was uh, it was uh, meant to be a concert opener for uh, Mahler's Ninth Symphony, for the Detroit Symphony. So... Um, I thought it would be fun to, you know, starting a piece is always a struggle, uh, especially with this one. I felt a lot of pressure with it, you know, it was a commission from the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, uh, Leonard Slatkin was conducting. And I had the great idea of, you know, why don't we start with a bit of Mahler 1? And it will tie in nicely to uh, the, 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 the second piece in the program, which is Mahler 9. And uh, so the, the, the piece starts with a few measures of uh, Mahler's first symphony, it just starts out that way, but very quickly goes in a different direction. Yeah, and I have to say, as a musician, when we first rehearsed this piece the other day, I mean, Mahler 1 is like so famous, and we've all played it a hundred times. As soon as that first bar came in, I was like, this is Mahler 1. But I got to give Joshua credit, because quoting other composers in your music is like an art form, because if you quote too much, it's cheesy, and if you quote not enough, nobody knows what you're doing. He hit the nail perfectly. It's like just enough notes for you to like have a, a taste of it, and then it's already off into his own thing. So I think he did a really, really good job with that. Um, can you tell us about the title of the piece? Uh, in German, Feuer trunken, but, but in English, what does that mean? Uh, drunk with fire, or <laughs> fire drunk. And, and you got that little phrase from the from poem Ode from, from yeah. Ode to Joy, from Beethoven. So, so can you talk a little bit about uh, how that influenced the piece? Yeah, so, the, so the line, if I remember it correctly, it's been a while, uh, we enter your heavenly sanctuary drunk with fire, which very much reminded me of, because at the time I was uh, going through the, the Divine Comedy, or trying to anyway, and uh, I was reading In the, Italian or translated? <laughs> no, translated. It was John Chardy. Um, I was reading the Purgatorio at the time, and I was very much inspired by that, um, uh, the climax of the Purgatorio, where Dante jumps into a, basically like a giant like, lake of fire as kind of his final purification before uh, entering paradise, which I thought tied in very nicely to that line from the poem, right? Um, nice, yeah. Yeah, so that was the connection, which I thought was, okay, that, that's really cool. Sure. Yeah. And, and so I know from, from reading a little bit about the piece that um, Joshua has said that, you know, while he drew some inspiration from these sources, um, the piece is not itself overtly programmatic. Um, however, I have to ask just from the performer's perspective, like towards the, I don't know, maybe two-thirds of the way through the piece, the piece kind of quiets down, and there's these little moments where the contrabassoon and some percussion have these little, like, isolated punctuations. What's, what's the idea there? Because that's just such a quirky little interesting moment of the piece. I, any thoughts on that? First of all, that was me. You're right that I didn't intend for it to be fully programmatic, except for that one moment in which I uh, kind of just imagined Dante standing in silence before the fire, before jumping in. And uh, it also sounded, uh, it, it also, um, I didn't do it, I didn't think I was doing it deliberately, but it turned very much... Um, to be uh, that way, but it's it's also kind of a, a quotation from a Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Oh, of course, yeah. Before the, the, the beginning of the Turkish the march. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right, That's right. great. 
Um, well, finally, that's, this is all great. We're really looking forward to playing your piece, and we have enjoyed rehearsing it all week. Oh, um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, for the last little bit? You know, where you're from, you know, any sort of other musical influences you have, anything, anything like that? Sure. I'm from the Philippines. I grew up there. Um, looking back, it's, it's kind of... Um, there's no reason for a person like me to, you know, be, be interested in classical music in the first place, in the second place, like writing orchestral music. There was kind of no reason for it, but it was just kind of a, something that was, a, you know, very, very, very much um, innate for some reason. Um, and I just uh, followed through with it. I ended up uh, going to conservatory in Singapore at first, um, at the Yang Sito Conservatory in Singapore, uh, studied composition there, and then moved on to Juilliard in New York, and that's how I uh, 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 kind of... Um, planted myself in the in the US that's great uh, <laughs> well Joshua we have enjoyed this piece all week thank you so much we're looking Thanks forward so to performing it tonight and uh, and you'll be here to listen of course yeah. right so great well then we'll see you up on stage to collect your of course well-deserved applause at that thank point. you thank you very excited to be here all right thank you Joshua big round of applause for him please thank you. All right, so next on the first half, uh, we have a piece by Wynton Marsalis, and I'm sure that that's a name that almost everyone here is familiar with. Yes, some great applause for Wynton. Um, so this piece was commissioned uh, jointly, a consortium of the uh, Philadelphia, Oregon, and Houston symphonies. And you all are very lucky because this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, the first performance of the Tuba Concerto outside of the original three commissioning orchestras. That's correct. So, and I think um, the way it works is that the orchestras that commission it have a, a contract that, like, that it grants them exclusive right to perform the piece up to a certain amount of time. And I'm pretty sure that the exclusivity period ended last week. So this is literally the earliest that anyone in the world could have heard this piece outside of those three cities uh, where it was commissioned. Uh, but anyway, Wynton Marsalis, of course, uh, just a great musician. A lot of people think of him as a jazz musician, but if you haven't, you should go online and check out some of his classical trumpet albums because he's one of these incredible people that can straddle the, the, the worlds of classical and jazz equally well. And in fact, um, he is the only musician in the history of the Grammy Awards to win a classical and a jazz Grammy in the same year, and he did it two years in a row. So, I mean, Wynton is just incredible. He's, he's the perfect uh, example of just, you know, this isn't jazz, this isn't classical, this is just music. Um, and so I would like to now welcome our soloist for the Wynton Marsalis Tuba Concerto, uh, T.J. Graff, who's our principal tubist here in the Florida Orchestra. Yeah. All right, so T.J., we've loved hearing you play this piece all week. He's, he sounded amazing, not to put any, like, you know, pre-pressure on him or anything, but he's going to sound amazing and you're going to love it. Really <laughs> remarkable, actually. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit, just for a minute, you know, where are you from? Where did you study? What brought you to the Florida Orchestra? Yeah, I'm from Roxbury, New Jersey. It's a town near Morristown, New Jersey, west of New York City. Yeah, <laughs> New Jersey. Uh, so I came to TFO by way of the University of Miami. I was down there studying tuba with really one of the best tuba teachers in the world who's done stuff like this, playing tuba concertos with orchestras more than just about anybody out there. Uh, his name's Aaron Tyndall, he's a phenomenal teacher. He's here this morning at the dress rehearsal. Uh, so I won the audition here at TFO in 2019, so this is my fourth season here. And uh, yeah, I'm really loving playing with this orchestra. All of my colleagues here are phenomenal. It's e Even me? Even you. <laughs> wow, thanks TJ. Uh, is this your first time playing a concerto with an orchestra? This is... Yes, this is my first time playing a concerto with an orchestra. I played with a band before, but not with an orchestra. All right, very good. And, and what do you find is like, what's the big difference between sitting in the back with us, you know, schlubbing it in the low brass section versus being up front as the featured soloist? You know, first of all, I play a whole lot more notes. I, I think I play more notes tonight than I played the entire rest of the season previous to this, and maybe including the rest of the season, you know, through May. <laughs> so, uh... Yeah, normally I make pretty good money per note sitting, <laughs> sitting in the back row. But uh, yeah, they're, they're working me a little harder tonight. So, so tonight you're earning your paycheck. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> or earning the season. <laughs> Great. Well, um, you know, maybe I'll, let, I'll turn it over to whichever you wants to speak. But uh, Fauzi or TJ, can you tell us a little bit about the tuba concerto? Yeah, so I, I really love this piece of music. I agreed to play it without ever having even heard it or seen it. You know, Michael uh, Francis, our music director, gave me a call right after it was premiered. You're like, hey, you want to play this? And I'm like, sure. 
Don't know what I'm signing myself up for, but I ended up really liking this piece of music. Uh, it's a little eclectic. It's really entertaining. All four movements are in totally different styles. So. Yeah, and even within each movement, he, he'll switch styles like every four or eight bars. It's like anything that you would think of as like jazz music, he's got it in there from like, right. you know, ragtime to, to big band to like New Orleans, like second line to, I mean, you name it, it's in there. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it, uh, adding on top of that, as you said, ragtime, there's bebop, there's mambo, there's uh, the gospel shuffle, church swing. I mean, it's just, and, and, and it's just so much of it. And the interesting thing, you said it earlier, Ross, is the fact that Winton, he, it, it, the purpose of the piece really is that he's trying to meld together the classical and the jazz styles in one. And he does it really, really well. Um, and you don't have to know all of these jazz styles, right? But you'll, you'll certainly recognize the jazz. I mean, you're going to be, you know, probably moving around a little bit, and that's okay. But, but, but you know, uh, that's something that he wanted to accomplish. And as far as the piece is concerned, you have to understand that, you know, Winton was writing, uh, he just finished the, the violin concerto around the 2017, and it was extremely successful. So with that momentum, he was trying to piggyback on that, right? And so that's why he wanted to write a piece for an instrument that was not necessarily in the front. And so, you know, he's, too, but sure enough, works out really well, and um, and I think it was really effective. It's, it's a great piece. You know, one one teeny little thing that I just noticed and, and thought was worth mentioning is that, you know, we all hear concertos all the time, and usually, you know, you'll hear something like Brahms' concerto for violin and orchestra or something. But I think it's really interesting how uh, Wenton Marcellus has chosen to title this piece "Concerto for Two Bist and Orchestra," yeah. not tuba. Right. But he, it's he's really focusing on the player, the person, and, and for me, that almost makes it more personal. It's not just like you're listening to a tuba, you're listening to a tubist, and we have a really great one here. So, I mean, I know that this piece was premiered and performed by three other really great orchestras, but, I mean, this guy, every bit of, of that caliber, so you're gonna really, really enjoy this. Any other thoughts about the Marcellus? Nope, all right. Well, thank you so much, TJ. We'll look forward to hearing you on the first half. Yeah, thank you, guys. So that brings us to the second half. Uh, after intermission, we're going to have some music by uh, Ellington and Gershwin. And uh, at the beginning, I kind of mentioned that, you know, Ellington didn't really think of himself as a jazz composer. In fact, uh, the, the words he used, he said, my music is beyond category. Uh, he, wanted, he really just wanted it to be American music. He wanted, he wanted to make an American sound. Um, he, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know a lot about Duke Ellington, but he was one of the most prolific composers ever. He wrote literally thousands of pieces over the course of his career uh, in both jazz and classical styles. Um, he really kind of got his start and became popular writing these, um, these like three minute tunes. And he wrote them to be that length because, and sorry, I'm showing my millennialness here for just a second. Um, is it a 78 RPM record? Is that what I'm thinking? The, they, they have three minutes of music per side, so he would write a song that would fit perfectly on these 78s. Um, but he wanted to break out of that. He wanted to do something bigger. And so he wrote this piece, Black, Brown, and Beige, which uh, is a lot more than three minutes, and was actually premiered at Carnegie Hall. Um, he, he had a concert uh, full of his music at Carnegie Hall, and uh, unfortunately, it, it didn't go over super well at the premiere. And, uh, and when people asked Duke Ellington, well, what do you think? Like, the critics didn't really love your piece. He said, well, I guess they just didn't dig it. <laughs> but thankfully, I think, I think it, was, it says more about the kind of the closed-mindedness of, of the critics at the time. Um, this was in 1943, right? So it's, it says a lot more about the critics that these critics are used to coming to the concert hall and hearing things like a Beethoven symphony. And, and to get confronted with something like black, brown, and beige, which, which obviously has a lot of jazz influence, I just don't think they knew what to do with it. I don't, I don't think they had anywhere to, to, to process it or anywhere to sort of categorize it in their, in their thought process about classical music. And so as a result, they kind of, they didn't know what to say about it. But anyway, do you have thoughts about the piece? Anything you want to call our attention to? I, I think that covered it pretty well, actually. But, um, you know, I want to talk uh, perhaps a little bit about the piece in itself. You know, it, it, the piece is about the history of an African-American, right, uh, in, in his self. And same thing, you know, if you, if you listen to the Gershwin, too. But, but when it comes to Ellington, 
when it starts, right off the bat, and we're going to play a little bit for you, actually. Um, it, when you listen to the beginning of the piece, you're going to start to notice these African drums, right? So the history of the African-American starting in Africa and the drums, and it's really prominent right in the beginning before we start to get into the war song and stuff like that. So Barbara, if I could trouble you, please, to just do demo number one. So you see right from the get-go, you, you hear it with all that, that rhythm in the beginning, and then it actually transfers over for a few measures until he starts to go into the to, to, to different jazz styles. Now you have to understand, once you have this African, you know, the original African rhythms coming in, and then you're going through Civil War, you're going through Spanish-American War, you're going through the Harlem Renaissance, you're going through all of this stuff. And, and as we listen to the piece, you have to hear that even though there's so much, you know, trouble and difficulty in their lives, you know, in, our, in the history of this country, there was always a foundation of joy in there, right? And then you'll hear it in this piece. There's a lot of joy, a lot of dance, a lot of music, a lot of fun. I mean, it, it, it's completely noticeable. Um, but there's also a couple of moments in the piece that I, I just want to play for you as well. And you got to stop me, by the way, if we have to move. Oh, okay. Well, we plenty of we're not going to do all that. Okay, so what, there's one, one part in particular. Um, has anybody heard of Come Sunday before, and it's okay if you don't. Yeah, and so you know, Come Sunday. It's is a very special tune for 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 a uh, very religious tune actually for Duke. He, it was very close to him, Duke Ellington. I mean, we're buddies, so I, I call him Duke. Um, you know, and and so not to get so much into it, but in the middle of the piece, there is this moment which is very intimate, okay? And there's solos, and you'll hear it with, in cello, and then you're going to hear it um, as well in, in the saxophone, expanded a little bit. And it's really meant to be a religious moment, one where, you know, African Americans are very religious people, especially in the South, and, and he, this, this in particular was very deep to him. And so when you hear that melody come out, I w really want you to think about how religious he was and how much it meant to him. And, and Barbara, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip one. If I could trouble you to play demo three, I would be grateful. So, it's quite lovely, isn't it? Um, and, you know, the thing about it is that he brings it back more than once. So again, when you hear it in, in, in the performance, he starts off giving it to the cello, right? Which Yoni does a fantastic job. And then when it goes to the saxophone, it is slightly expanded. And, and it just sounds absolutely marvelous. And with these musicians, it's just as touching, let me tell you. It's really remarkable. So, and then as we pass that, that's really a, the pinnacle moment of, of the piece, in my opinion. But then we're going to go through towards the end. More jazz goes through your body, and then you're going to hit jung, uh, jungle jazz, stuff like that, which we don't have to talk about, but it's in the beginning of the third movement where really it's the foundation of joy. And I, I'm going to turn around probably and see if anybody's going to be dancing, okay? It's, I, you know, because I know I will be. Um, but so basically when, as you listen to the piece, really try to think about in the beginning, first movement, difficulty, right? Really trying to survive in this world, but also because of faith and religion and, and the fact that joy is really the foundation of, of where they come from, it, 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 even though it's a very troubled history, the piece in itself overall is a joyful one, okay? And it's, it's really a lot of fun. So I think we can move on to another one. Sure. So of course, we're gonna close out the evening with George Gershwin's An American in Paris. And I'm sure most of you have probably heard that piece before. Um, this is another interesting one that uh, that's some of the critics didn't really know what to do with at first. Uh, and I, I found an interesting quote by uh, Gershwin. He said, it's not a Beethoven symphony, you know. It's a humorous piece, nothing solemn about it. It's not intended to draw tears. 
If it pleases symphony audiences as a light, jolly piece, a series of impressions musically expressed, it succeeds. And I think it, it does that really well. And it's, it's of course, found a, a huge home in the, in the classical music repertoire over the years in the orchestral canon. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't really need to give too much introduction to George Gershwin. I think a lot of people know about it. Anything from your perspective? Well, I mean, we could talk about the story, certainly. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, how many people have heard um, An American Paris? Uh, yeah, none of you, right? Okay. So, um, you know, the story as it goes, right? The American is visiting Paris. And for those of you who don't know the story, he's coming to Paris, you know, and it's a new sight, it's a new sound, it's a new world, it's a new country, you know, completely foreign. And then you're just, I mean, okay, here's a question. How many people have been to Paris? Okay, none of you too. So, um, you know, as you know, when you go there, it's just an incredible experience, right? It's a very magical city. And, 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 and I mean, I, I, I feel the same way when I go there. And the moment you get there, you hear everything, the traffic, the taxi horns, people walking, you know, people in cafes are all watching you and everything. It's just an incredible experience. So, interesting thing about Gershwin is that when he was there, it was his third trip to Paris. And it was really, that's where he was starting to get that feel. And he was, oh, something is falling from the heavens. What is that? Oh. All right. Um, maybe it's Gershwin. Anyway, so, um, you know, he was there because he was looking to buy those, those taxi horns, actually. French taxi horns. And sure enough, that's where he got them. And, um, but, but it was that experience, searching for those horns and whatnot, that he did feel what it's like going into Paris. He loved Paris, but you know, going around and seeing people, and you hear that in the music. So I, I just want to play um, a little bit of the beginning, which is really should set the tone of someone walking in Paris and just enjoying everything that it has to offer. Barbara, if I can trouble you in demo five, please. So did you hear it all? Sean Elysee, are we there? Right? It's all there. And, and so, you know, and, and as we progress through the piece, again, towards the middle of the piece, it's going to get a little bit more intimate, just like in Ellington, actually. And, but in this instance, the American is, you know, missing home a little bit. And it, it is a homesickness theme, is, is what we tend to call it. And, and it, it becomes a lot more intimate, a lot more lyrical. Um, and, and it's where, when the American actually is like, gosh, you know, I, I really miss home. Um, you know, I mean, this is a great city, but I miss home. And then it extends that way for a lot of minutes. Um, but then eventually, as, as we get to the end of the piece, you'll notice the return of the theme, just as you, just you hear in the beginning of the piece. In, in that moment, when you hear that, I'd, I'd love for you to think about the fact that this American was sat in the in cafe thinking about home, and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, the sounds and the smells of Paris, the air, the people, the taxi horns and everything come back to him and really you can't help but want to be there. And that's what happens towards the end of the piece. It's just absolutely in love with Paris and then the American realizes, you know, this is actually where I want to be. And that's kind of what the piece is about. Not much more than that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, will, I will close by saying that this is one of my personal favorite things about music is its ability to transport us through time and space, to, to let us... I mean, I've never been to Paris, but through playing this piece, I almost feel like I have. And that's an incredible uh, power that music has over us. And uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir because y'all are here at a live concert, but there's something special about hearing it live. It, you can listen to your favorite recording all you want, but there's something incredible that you only get from being in the concert hall, from witnessing it being like created. I mean, this music, music you can't touch it, you can't smell it, but like it's in the air all around us. And uh, it's, it's the most exciting privilege for all of us on stage to get to play it for you. And I'm sure that, that Fauzi feels the same way conducting it. Um, any closing thoughts before we head out of here? We're just absolutely grateful you guys are here. Happy New Year. Enjoy the concert. Okay. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the concert.